Hello guys! Welcome back to another video, and today I have something special for all of you, something that is hopefully going to be the start of a new series, and I am here joined with Bear Gardener. So, what we're going to be doing here today is I'm going to be going through a specific event in cards history. In this case, it is going to be the first ever OCC, and I have a series of cards that were played in this OCC, and a series of cards that were not played in this OCC. And I'm going to be giving to them these cards to Bear in pairs, and Bear is going to be analyzing the cards and then explaining his thoughts on what the point of the two cards are, and what the value of the two cards are, and what the likelihood of them being played, and then try to figure out which of these cards saw play in the first ever OCC. So, Bear, please introduce yourself. Hey, uh, I'm Bear Gardner. Um, I, some of you probably already know me, the rest of you who don't. I am relatively new to the game. I've been here for ooh, about eight months now. Uh, quickly fell into content creating. Uh, reason I'm doing this, I guess, is because before this I have like 30 years in different card games. So I started playing Magic the Gathering when it basically started. And I've probably played pretty much every other competitive card game I can think of in the time both physically and digitally, so someone, thank you Jay King, thinks I, I have a decent analytical mind for cards, so thought this would be a really good idea. Uh, I am both really excited and utterly terrified at the idea of trying to figure out a meta in 10 minutes. All right, so thank you very much for that. Let's now get into the event. So to set the stage, cards only ever had one previous official wide tournament which was the 2019 Cards World Championship, which was the first ever tournament, big tournament in cards. Obviously, there was small community-run tournaments in the Discord, I'm sure, dating back to the Alpha, but this was the first big event in 2019. And by this point, the only there was no expansions. There was just the base set in cards. However, immediately following the World Championship, they released the first ever expansion in cards, Allegiance. And then they brought on um, Ollie Krumi, who to be the head of cards esports they wanted to start building their own esports scene in the cards and ollie krumi by may of 2020 came up with the idea for an officer club championship a monthly tournament where the top eight players from ladder would compete it out so this was the first time that we had a a regular tournament so the occ won there hadn't been a tournament in about six months you qualified off the may 2022 season so the top eight players on this list qualified to the first ever occ which was in June 2020. So there had not been a real competitive event in cards for about seven months, and there had not been a single one in since the first expansion drop. Also, there was a balance patch in June 2020, a couple weeks before the event. So people were bringing some wild decks, people were reacting to the meta, so keep that in mind. And the... Cards that were in this collection, as I mentioned, are just the base set and allegiance. So you can actually go to your collection and filter by this um, to see all of the cards that existed in the pool at this time. Now, obviously, a lot of these cards have changed, but uh, feel free to now um, take a look through this pool, see what strategies existed, see what notable cards did not exist. Um, so notably, Poland and Finland did not exist yet. Um, we had just gotten Italy and France. And uh, the game was very, very different. Um, so, Bear, I'll, I'll give you some time to look through this. Um, let sure, me I mean, know I'm, if I'm, anything I'm stands out to you. And, yeah, I'm scrolling, and the, this this is so different. This, this is tiny by comparison. <laughs> this, this, this is like micro-meta. That doesn't mean in any way, shape, or form for anybody who hears me say this that that means I'm going to be any good at this, but this is a tiny collection of cards by comparison to what we're at at the minute. Although, there are a few familiar cards. Yeah, it's scrolling through this myself, it's... Wow, I, I, there's, a, there's a sense of nostalgia for some of these cards that were like, back in the day, it was like, wow, some of these were really good. <laughs> and just completely outclassed by... I mean, I'm not going to lie, it is nice to see, like, I miss Monty, because he was only around for, like, five minutes when I first got into this game, and I really liked Monty. 
is probably one of my most played cards. You just reminded me to click the uh, reserved, show reserved cards button. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's cards like this. I just, I, you know, there are cards that you, you, I imagine you guys must miss many, many more than I do. Um, I, I Oh, shelling. This, um, uh, Baron Von Gloa pointed shelling out to me a while back and I was like, this was a legitimate card? <laughs> That's insane. Okay. I I I don't want to say I have a good grasp on this, but I think I've got enough of one that I can look at a card and see what it's up against. All right. Uh, and I shall fall for as needed. I'm keeping this open just in case I need reference. You you don't need to answer, but I'm curious if you have any preliminary guesses as to what you think people will play and what, what you think was popular. So, I'm looking at this, I cannot imagine somebody somewhere wasn't playing at least some air-based Britain decks. Um, because there's, there's a few things in here that obviously are still around, and then there's... Although, a lot of the really, really strong stuff... Not so much, but we still have all the old favourites that are going in, but yeah, the fact that I'm seeing things like, like Swordfish and Gladiator still around, and obviously Monty's great if you want to pin your opposition. I can imagine Britair being a thing. Uh, I'm taking a wild guess, given that they're shiny and new, that some people were playing a fair bit of Italy. Um, I might be wrong, but we'll find out. So, I can tell you now... Every single nation was represented in the first ever OCC. Major and minor. Wow. Okay, that's slightly terrifying. So I, I suppose I should explain the format of the first ever OCC. You sure. were there was no nation restrictions yet. You could bring two of the same nation. However, the rules were you could not play the same nation two games in a row, win or lose. So, if you brought two decks of the same nation, you would have to play your third deck in game two. So, it would give your opponent an idea of what you were doing. However, this was also a closed decklist tournament, but every single game was streamed one at a time, so you could watch the stream to see what they were playing in the previous rounds if they weren't your first opponent. But if they were your first round opponent, you had no idea what they were playing. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, the, the format changed a lot for the better. <laughs> this was, we were all learning the ropes at this point. <laughs> I mean, this is like, that's that's like walk-in magic tournament levels of just figure it out as you go and hope your deck's good. Um, okay, that's, that's the, the idea of being able to play the same nation twice does break my brain. Yes, so um, I have a, an order for these cards. I think you are ready for um, your first ever, your, your, your first pair of cards. And I will say now, each of these, you'll be given two cards, and they I've tried to sort them to be similar. Each one will be a card of the same nation, um, and for the most part, they have a similar effect or would generally serve a similar role in a deck. Some are two different strategies to try to figure out which of the two different strategies people were going for. Um, but of these, I have... 12, I believe, pairs for you. Uh, 10 of these, one of them is played. For one of them, both are played, and for one of them, neither were played. So, keep that in mind. Uh, oh, yeah, make it Because okay. <laughs> that's always a possibility. If you get two cards that you think are both absolutely terrible, or two cards that you think must be played, surely these are staples of the format. Uh, keep that in okay. mind. Um, I do like that, though. Keep, it'll keep me on my toes. So, your first pair of cards are... We're, we're starting with US, and you have Death from Above or Torpedo Attack. So, I just sent you the pictures, but you can also look at them in your collection. Okay. So, Death from Above, I am familiar with, because it's still around now, and it still sees play. I mean... I'm just doing my train of thought out loud here, but Death From Above, I didn't, I know, has decent value all day. Much less so at higher level, in my opinion, than some people think. Um, torpedo Attack. 
a card I have no memory or knowledge of. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Um, I am moderately confident of my answer here. Uh, I am going to say, of the two of these, based on the sheer number of Blitz units and the the earliness of this in the game, that my money is on the fact that Torpedo Attack would have seen play because three cost destroy anything in the front line has got to be an incredibly good tool. And there's no random element, and I know how much card gamers hate random. So, between Death From Above and Torpedo Attack, the one that saw play in the first ever OCC was, in fact, Death From Above. It was zero torpedo attacks in this event. Now, I should say, there, there's a slight caveat here um, for the, the, the entire event. The deck lists were never published, so I had to go based off of what cards I remember being played and what cards were seen on stream. And there was one deck that just... An opponent got, or a player got 2 0 in the first round and just never brought one of their decks. So I don't even know what that third deck was. So there's a very slight possibility somebody had it, but at the very least, it was never seen on stream. Uh, and I'm pretty confident that nobody had Torpedo Attack in this event. Now, Death from Above. Do you think this was a, a, a sort of a one off card? Um, not necessarily a literal one of, but. Just a, do you think this was a odd choice, or do you think this was a, a more popular card in the format? I've kind of got to believe that this was more popular than just one person or two people did something with it. Removal of any kind is always so good, and it's not like Death From Above is bad in metas now, so I've got to believe it was more than like one deck that was running this. So, in this event... There was two different decks run in it. As far as I'm aware, only two decks. It was only played in two decks, but they were two very wildly different decks. And I'm not going to say what they are yet, um, just because that might give some clues in the future. Um, but now, looking at Torpedo Attack, looking at Death from Above, these are the versions that are in the game now. Do you think either of these cards were either better or worse in the past? Were we running a better version of Death From Above, and that's why it was seen play? Or was there a worse version of Torpedo Attack, and that's why it wasn't seen play? Or do you think these versions are the same as... I've got to, I've got to defend my own honor to some <laughs> degree here as we open up and point out. I've got to believe that... Of the two, I can't imagine... I've got to believe Death From Above had to have seen a nerf at some point. Like, I cannot imagine that it would outclass Torpedo Attack in my head in a game that's so focused on frontline control. So, I, uh, oh, yeah. So, Death From Above has always been four credits, and the effect has remained the same. Um, Death From Above has never been changed. And before anyone starts coming at me, I, I, I am talking about changes in 2020 not in, like, the very early beta or alpha. I, I don't know what, if, what Death From Above was back when the game was played by 100 people. I, I am talking about since events started, Death From Above has always been in this current version. Torpedo Attack, however, used to be uh, four credits, and I'm sending it to you now, but a pretty self-explanatory change. Torpedo Attack was formerly four credits, and that is why it was less popular. People just saw better options at removing things for four credits. Um, yeah. If, you're, if not, you're playing like a heavier not... deck, there's better removal. Um, and if you're playing a faster deck, you don't want your opponent in the front line by turn four. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Like, you show me it at four credits and suddenly it is way, way less appear appealing than Death From Above. Because if... It... <sighs> That's, it's just, I know people are going to say it's one credit, and I get that, but in a game like this, one credit can make such a huge difference. Because, like, turn four, I can destroy a thing in the front line. Okay, sure. Especially as a special, given that you can also run three death from above. Yeah, that, that is that is a pretty big difference. And um, this was buffed in June 2021, um, so about a year after this event, it was buffed, and it, well, 
it didn't really see much play. I I need to be careful because we might be doing more of these in the future, so uh, I don't want to give oh, away yeah, no, like, too much information. Like, but Torpedo like, Attack didn't see a ton of play, um, even at three credits. Just there's too many decks like Air in the meta where they will never take the front line the entire game, so you don't really want a piece of removal that will never be able to be played. Um, yeah, I can. Um, I, I I am blinded by my habits of um, seeing an awful lot of frontline play, which um, is interesting to see changing at the moment in card. So it's interesting. Off to a good start then. So uh, the next pair of cards we have is first rifles versus night witches. Now these are two cards which have been completely reworked from what they used to be. And I'm going to tell you what they used to be at the time of this event, because there's no possible way you could guess. And these cards do not seem to be similar whatsoever um, in their current versions. So I that will... That makes me happy, because <laughs> I was about to ask. <laughs> now, these are the original versions. These were the versions that existed in the game at the time of this tournament. Right. Okay. <laughs> Now I start to see why we're comparing these two cards. I was really hoping like one of them was going to not be an elite to make my, my decision <laughs> between these two easier. Because um, <laughs> th these are both cards that make my brain go, okay, th these just th this is just value. Now again, you always have the possibility that they were running both. Would you want both of these in the same deck? <laughs> I know, don't do that to me. Uh... Or just throwing it out there. Could be neither. Maybe maybe nobody was trying to go to fatigue uh, in in this meta. I, I, that I'm not buying. <laughs> I, I was in this event, so... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not buying that that's true. Um, oh man, these are so good. Uh, I can see why they've been changed. I'm going to lean pure value. I, unless I am misreading the text, first rifles is just insane <laughs> because you're adding the same card, which then adds two copies of the same card, each of which adds two copies of the same card. Yep. Uh, so is that your uh, your, your guess in first rifles? Just check it. I'm rereading Night Witches <laughs> to make sure I'm not missing something incredibly obvious. I suppose I didn't get the token, but the Polycarp off 1 2 bomber. Um, Cheers. I was just looking that up. Um, so it's a 1 2 bomber to your support line. It's back to you. you have infinite 1 2 bombers versus endless 3 5. No, I'm, I'm still sticking with my instincts on this. If I was playing this game, I, I would want to play around with infinite 3 5 guards. So, um, in this case, you are absolutely correct. First Rifles was played in this uh, tournament by, I think, a couple different, um, basically just Soviet value lists where you just play it because it's a, it's a decent body and you'll get more guards and you can never lose on fatigue, so you don't really have to worry about that. Um, I would not say fatigue at this point in the game was a particularly common um, occurrence, but just to not have to worry about that whatsoever, it's a fine thing for putting one card in your deck. Um, I will say, a lot of people did not like first rifles because they thought it diluted the deck. Because you'd play a first rifles on turn four, just because you're playing it on curve and your opponent would kill it, and then later in the game it's, say, turn 12, and your opponent has a big bomber on the board and you're trying to find an answer to it, and you draw a 3-5 infantry into a second 3-5 infantry, and you can't even play them or else it will put more 3-5 infantries into your deck that accomplish nothing. Um, however, if you're playing against an aggro deck, then 3-5 guard is a 3-5 guard. Whereas Night Witch is, at this point, a 1-2 bomber is just really, really bad. Um, Soviet air did not exist. I don't think I'm really spoiling much by saying that. However, you may have heard people talk about Night Witches um, in the past. I'm, I'm not sure how familiar you are with people talking about Night Witches. This is one of the most talked about former cards in the game, at least in my circles. I am familiar... <laughs> I'm very familiar with the the so a number of competitive players who've been around for a while have mentioned Night Witches to me many many times over, which is why I was constantly rereading the card before making my choice when looking at these. So uh, I'm so nervous actually about going with my natural instinct. So uh, Night Witches was buffed 
shortly after this tournament, um, in September 2020, and it was buffed to this version of the card. Okay, that's insane. Yes. I mean, that's very, <laughs> very cool, but for the value of that card for one credit. So, they did that, and then I won my first ever OCC the following month, and the month after that I went back to back, and both times I brought Soviet Night Witches, where it's just an infinite deck where you try to hit Night Witches as quickly as possible and just play one Night Witch every single turn until you win the game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I am... I... I cannot see why you wouldn't do it, mostly because I happen to know that sometimes you and I think that similarly, and it's exactly what I would have done. So that's my favorite because deck. Why wouldn't you? In the history of cards, it's the most fun I've ever had. Most people kind of hated it. It made tournaments awful, because inevitably you would have two people playing a Night Witch's Mirror against each other, and the match would go on for about an hour, and it was if it was a Swiss round, everyone else is waiting on that one pair of people in a Night Witch's Mirror. <laughs> <laughs> made every okay, single turn of an awful yeah. um so very shortly later in january 2021 so four months later they nerfed it to this version this version which is marginally less insane however also in january 2021 breakthrough came out the uh expansion after allegiance and or the big expansion after allegiance i should say and Night Witches just got outclassed by the new research cards that would just win conditions on a stick. Winning in Fatigue was no longer really a thing you could do. And then six months later, they changed the Night Witches and um, First Rifles to their current versions. They decided they wanted to just get rid of Fatigue blockers from the game to stop, like, two-hour-long games um, and make the game more accessible to new players. So they decided to just completely get rid of those effects and change them completely. Uh, so that is the brief history of the Soviet Fatigue uh <laughs> I love that stuff though because that's that's the sort of thing that happens in the evolution of so many games there are a number of other competitive games i've played that have either mill or fatigue conditions and then there are like infinite spam combos and someone finds a way to go yeah if i'm just patient i'm just gonna win it might be really slow and very annoying for my opponent but i'm gonna win I can see why they changed them. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I, I also see it. As much as I love Night Witches, I understand it. And I just hope one day we get it back. So, moving on to the third pair of cards. Next up, we have Japan. And this one I'm very excited for. Um, because we have Divine Wind versus Empire of the Sun. Okay. This is going to be very difficult. This one is probably going to require you to look through what other cards were in Japan. Um, try to figure out what what strategy people were doing with Japan. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of I'm scrolling. I'm both looking at the cards and scrolling the limited collection as described by you at the same time, and trying to work out whether there's something in here that's going to help me figure out what people were trying to do. I like this though. This is this is the thinky part. Oh. Oh. Okay. I'm gonna take a punt at this point. I, I, I did like a couple of searches for keywords and, 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 and now I'm I'm just gonna grab my my confidence with both hands and say looking at the, the Japan pool that's available, I I am guessing that Divine Wind saw some play because there are quite a lot of discard synergy cards sitting in Japan as I filter this collection and being able to destroy a unit and then proc even if it is random something from your hand versus 10 credits to just draw feels like the 3 credit destroy a unit's got to be good value and this is where you tell me I'm completely wrong so in fact um, you are completely wrong. The card that saw play in this tournament was Empire of the Sun, and, uh, I realize I forgot to do this last round, but we're gonna bring it back here for you. Was this card, um, just a weird tech choice, or was this card incredibly popular? I want to believe this has got to be <laughs> some kind of weird tech choice that I'm just not seeing. Or there's a completely different version of this card, because I, I cannot see it. So... Empire of the Sun, or as it was more commonly known, Empire of the Fun, 
was one of the most popular cards in the format. Um, every single time Japan was... Well, okay, that's not true. Um, but Japan... Every time Japan was al present as an ally nation, Empire of the Fun was in the deck. Because Empire of the Sun, at the time, people just thought was the best draw in the entire format. And Japan as an ally nation for slower decks was the most popular choice. Well, tied for the most popular choice with one other nation um, that we will get to. So, with that being said, I have to throw it to you. Do you think either of these cards used to be different? I'm still wrapping my head around when you have things like expansion in existence, that seeing Empire as the Sun as a good draw. But okay, if it was if it was that good draw, please tell me that it cost less. So, Empire of the Sun in this tournament was exactly the same. It was a 10 cost order. Empire of the Sun used to be 9 credits, but was nerfed two weeks before the event. It was so popular and so strong, it had to be nerfed and people brought it anyway. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> now, people, people saw the game very differently back then. Yes. <laughs> now, Divine Wind, on the other hand, has never been changed. However, discard as a self-discard was not an archetype yet. Betty was completely different. Um, and... I... Yeah, the, at the time, it was meant to be a tempo card in an aggressive deck where you you just either have an empty hand or you don't care because you're destroying a big guard unit and going face with all your cheap units. It was meant to be an aggro card. And why would you run that when you can run Sendai Regiment? Um, so Divine Wind just never really saw play, and then they brought in all of the self-discard synergy stuff later. Um, so yeah, that is... Curiosity, what did Betty used to look like? Um, Betty used to be just deployment discard a card. It was meant to just be a very aggressive bomber, cheap high attack bomber you can toss on the board early and control unit trades. Or alternatively just bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but really. It's, that, that, that's not just cheap tempo, that's just bad. Yes, there was, like, supply chain existed in the game, um, but, like, nobody was doing Japan-US for the supply chain-Betty combo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. No, no, I, I, I can see. Yeah. Fair. Yeah, I, they, they tried to do this in Hearthstone. Early on in Hearthstone, um, there was a, a... I don't know how familiar you are with Hearthstone, but they tried to do this these aggressively statted cards that would discard cards from your hand as just, like, a, a cost to play these higher statted units early. And it was just never a thing, and they made self-discard a deck much later with actual synergy cards, rather than just losing card yeah, advantage. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that, that all happened before I, I chose to use the exit door, because I was quite an early Hearthstone adopter, but I hit the exit door as soon as we started seeing the proliferation of a card that creates another card <laughs> and another card, and, and I, then I just was like, no, my brain doesn't want to do this anymore. It's topical uh, for our, our current point in cards. Um... I did warn you about loud <laughs> through video. <laughs> Moving on. Yes. <laughs> Moving on, um, we are getting to Britain. So, for Britain, we, we have an interesting, uh, <laughs> some interesting guides to compare. We have Coldstream Guides versus Baluk Regiment. Now, I've sent you the pictures because I'm pretty confident these are two cards you have probably never seen. <laughs> I mean, I know Coldstream because I used it a bit in my very first deck where I was looking for any way to buff bombers that was remotely efficient. So, like, throw down a guard and get naval support to, like, turn a tiny bomber into something vaguely useful. Not gonna lie... Baluk Regiment, I, I know I own it in the collection. <laughs> I I have never looked at it. This is this is like it's like baby version of Well also, no, because no, I was about to say it's kind of got value with the HQ defense, but okay. Um well it's also hard because this is like my favorite nation in the game, which will shock nobody. I'm sorry. I'm sorting through Britain's infantry right now. <laughs> no worries. Take um, all the time you need. All right. 
so I'm on a punt here because honestly I'm I'm punting because part of me wants to look at Balut Regiment and go, well, Commonwealth was still in the game, so HQ defense is kind of a thing. And I'm not seeing a lot of other amazing tools for it, but that makes me think that Commonwealth would just be really, really hard to get to. Um, so I... I... I'm going to grab myself just randomly here and go, I'm not convinced, honestly, I know you said there were some some side throws in here. I'm not convinced either of these sort of play. So, because they're both okay, but neither of them makes me think, but you could do this. So I'm curious, what do you think Britain was doing in this, the, this point in cards? So... You, you see the cards that existed in the British pool, and you know Britain was present as a main nation in this tournament. What were they doing, do you think? So, I'm kind of thinking that they, they kind of, in my head, when I'm looking at this pool, I'm thinking... A combination of orders that are using things like pin and restriction, so board control to a degree, or at least controlling your opponent's position, and then artillery and bombers are the two things that I'm looking at going, that could work. You've got things like Albacore that's got pin, you've got some decent bombers on board, Lancaster's still around. What on earth is precision bombing? Sorry, I, <laughs> on a tangent. I just spotted Manchester and went, what? <laughs> No, that again though. Manchester is also making me think that I'm probably not wrong because a seven cost bomber that adds a piece of removal to your hand isn't terrible. But yeah, my instinct is the the Britain thing here would be trying to leverage reach while stopping your opponent from getting to your HQ. But I'm sure you're about to educate me on some completely bizarre guard spam strategy <laughs> that somehow worked. So. There were two strategies in Britain present at this tournament. Um, there was just Britain as a control package. Um, you just play some healing cards, you play some guard cards, you, you beat Jagro. Um, and then there was a version of Britain Air. Um, now, this is a version of Britain Air that we are not familiar with in the present day. Um, and I'm saying that because this version of Britain Air ran Coldstream Guards. <laughs> <laughs> and it was actually what you said at the very beginning uh, of this section, which is, the point is it's just an early guard to protect your bombers, and then you would buff the health of your bombers, um, and then you would play Naval Supply Run, or not Naval, uh, Naval Support, and try to make like a 3-3 bomber, 5-5 bomber, and then just do what Betty couldn't do, and control the board with a bomber that doesn't die to Bloody Sickle. Um, so that is actually the Coldstream Guards, and oddly enough, Baluk Regiment, it saw zero play in this tournament. Baluk Regiment used to be incredibly popular. Baluk Regiment was in the winning deck, the best deck of the player who won the 2019 World Championship. Baluk Regiment used to be a staple on ladder before Allegiance came out, um, but after Allegiance came out, Baluk Regiment kind of fell out of favor a little bit. Um, it still was probably a pretty popular card on ladder and looking back at this tournament i was kind of surprised to not see any baluk regiments because of how popular i remember it being um at the time around the time of this tournament so with that all being said do you think coldstream guides or baluk regiment used to be any different than their current versions do you think they used to be better do you used to be worse so i i am prepared to accept that with access to things like Cup of Tea and a bit of patience, Coldstream Guards, as it is, could be attractive enough. Although it wouldn't surprise me if Noble Support was perhaps cheaper. Because it still feels like an awful lot of push for a small result. But like you said, this is a version of Brett that I'm not familiar with. I Baluk Regiment, if it saw that much play and was that popular on ladder, I kind of think it's perhaps got to have had some kind of stat nerf in the time i mean it is i there's value in it hq defense is never bad we've had this conversation with the the glamour boys 
endlessly, in fact. <laughs> so And three cost is is cheap for HQ defense. But yeah, I've got to believe Balut Regiment might have been changed, but I'm 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 pretty prepared to accept that Coldstream Guards might have been just as is and yeah. just really, really useful with bombers. So Coldstream Guards was as is, and you are correct, Balut Regiment was changed. However, it was actually buffed. It used to be worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were running Baluk Regiment when it was plus two defense, because man, that plus I mean, two I defense suppose... mattered. <laughs> I mean, I suppose when you haven't got fortification flying around, and you haven't got honey, which was the well, big thing that... that fortification was in the format. Fortification oh, right. is a base card. We were running Baluk Regiment. <laughs> I'm not saying it was correct, I'm saying it was popular. <laughs> <laughs> no no i just when i was scrolling through the orders i missed fortification somehow and now no i mean i'm looking at I, okay i i love you guys to pieces but you were insane <laughs> i mean i know like three attack on a guard but a guard with high attack is not that good so come on children i um, think the idea was just you wanted a body like people looked at fortification and saw why would you play a card like you you play fortification and then they hit you in the face for seven because you didn't play any units. You just wanted a this body. <laughs> now, this, 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 was Fifth Brigade somehow way way worse? Because uh, Fifth Brigade is out there, and that's a two cost one five guard body. So we aren't gonna get to that in this video. Okay. Um, so I, I I will just say like it, it's not one of the preselected cards. I mean, and it's probably not gonna come up later. Um, but Fifth Brigade was incredibly popular. Index with Baluk Regiment. We ran both. And 5th Brigade was present in this tournament and saw a lot of play in the um, Britain control lists. I mean, that doesn't shock me because it's just a really good value guard at two cost unless you've got a bigger pool and lots more deployment effects and weird stuff going on. I, I'm just still trying to get over what you guys were smoking to be regularly playing <laughs> Baluk Regiment with <laughs> two HQ defense, but what it, do I know? Power creep's a thing, right? But I will okay. say... At this point, there was a lot of players who were, did had very, very small collections. Like, the, the player base was much smaller, so you ran into players with small collections just, like, basically doing their dailies, trying to hit Field Marshal and then Peace. Yeah. Um, and all of, almost all of those players were playing some version of Japan Burn because it was incredibly easy to create. It was entirely standards and limited, and you just ran every single card that says deal damage to the enemy HQ. Um, so you just wanted anything that said gain HQ defense. <laughs> No, I, I, to be fair, when I had a quick glance at the, the Japan pool, I did notice that those cards were still very prevalent. So that that doesn't shock me. Anything to say, I, no, please don't just make me die from turning up. Yeah, so Baluk was actually not buffed until January 2023. Um, so Wow. <laughs> it remained at two defense for quite some time. And now we have um, one I'm very excited for. A pairing that I'm very excited for and I don't think you are ready for. So. Okay. We have the B-29 Super Fortress and Strategic Planning. You, I'm loving this, by the way. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> we need to do more of this, but, but are you trying to break my brain? <laughs> I'm so confused. <laughs> I mean, in the current meta, the, both of these cards are basically terrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've got to go look at the US. This is why this is fun, but I've got to look at the US collection because I've got to be missing something. Because, okay. Oh, give me orders. The solution to this is going to be how much ramp was in the game. Because that's insane. I'm reaching the point where I'm not actually able to believe that I'm going to utter the following sentence. <laughs> but, alright, so ramp was clearly a thing. There are some ramp cards in there. And we know that guards were prevalent from things that you've, other, you've said in control decks. So, that's, 
I'm so going to be wrong on this, but I, I'm going to say he, that this is... He, was this the heyday of the Super Fortress? Did this thing ever actually see play? So, unfortunately, this was not the heyday for the Super Fortress. Um, if you were playing a ramp deck, you could never get the front line. And cards like Bolster didn't exist in the game yet. We had Land for, of the Free, um, but Land of the Free on a 15 drop um it's a, a little much um and you could just play b17s and avengers and your opponent would probably lose the game on that alone this was the heyday for strategic planning though the first and i believe only time this card has ever been played in anywhere remotely close to a meaningful tournament maybe was brought to some opens um a bit after this but strategic planning was brought to this tournament now do you think these cards oh so do you think strategic planning was a one of or do you think it was popular in the format i'm preempting the previous question because i have to believe something for to, to maintain my sanity <laughs> and it makes me think that this was probably way more popular than i can imagine that there was something truly truly bonkers that this just did and worked so i'm gonna believe this this saw a chunk of play so this was only played by one player in one deck. However, that player did get to the finals and lost 3-2. Um, okay. But they did make it to the finals and win with this deck in the finals. Do you think strategic planning or Super Fortress used to be any better or worse than their current versions? I just, I'm defending my own honor here and saying, please, you've got to tell me that these cards were less terrible than they currently are, even if it's marginally. Neither Super strategic Fortress planning. or Strategic Planning have ever been changed. Those are the versions on release, and that is the version of Strategic Planning that was played in this tournament. And this, this one actually has a little bit of a story behind it, which is part of the reason I picked it. The other part is it's just hilarious, because Strategic Planning is a card I'm pretty sure 99% of the player base does not know exists in the game. <laughs> I mean, this, I, I'm not going to lie, I, I am aware that it is there because I have scrolled past it while looking at old cards in the collection. Not that I've ever read it in any different, because I looked at it and went, eh, okay. So, Clearly I was wrong, so I'm fascinated by the story as to how this was good. The story behind this card... Is, I, now, I, I was not the player who brought this card. However, I am involved in why it was brought. Because it was the first ever tournament, and no one really knew what to bring, because everyone played only one deck on ladder, and I'm not going to say what that deck was, but everyone who qualified to this tournament played to the exact same deck, down to like probably 35, 36 of the same cards to get into this tournament. And now you have to bring two other decks to the event, or at least one other deck to the event. Um, so we were looking at, well, what other decks are we going to play? Nobody ever plays anything else. Um, so we were trying out a wide variety of other things to just be, well, what's the second best deck and what's going to beat the second best deck? Because you're both going to start on the best deck, probably, because you want to play it in games one and three um, because of the way the format's set up. So you're both going to be playing the second best deck in game two. So that is we're entering mind games territory. And in my testing, I tested around with Soviet Japan, or sorry, US Japan ramp, where I just threw in a bunch of ramp cards, a bunch of Osaka regiments, <laughs> which is the 4-7 guard. I'm just looking up the Osaka regiment. Um... Yeah, I ran some Tagasakis, I ran some Osaka regiments, I just threw in like all of the Japanese guards, all of the US ramp, and then I ran some weakened do for healing and a strategic planning. And the f I played like two games of this deck in casual. And the first game I, I got absolutely destroyed. And in the second game, I played like a turn nine strategic planning to make two 820 Osaka regiments that my opponent had no removal for. And I won the game. And I thought that was hilarious. So I opened up Twitch and went to the streamer um, Blue Blast, who was streamed all the time and was also in the OCC and he was streaming his practice matches for the OCC like testing out different decks as well and I said you gotta try strategic planning ramp the deck's amazing as a joke and he was like that sounds so stupid that I'm gonna try it so he played it on stream as a joke as well and then won five games in a row with it on ladder stopped playing it on stream and then submitted it to the tournament <laughs> 
and then got second. <laughs> And then people pretty much immediately realized, actually, this card is just really, really bad. <laughs> and that was the rise and fall of strategic planning. Just it got its day in the sun. Yeah, the flash in the flash in the pan uh, moment. <laughs> so basically, two really good players got on the idea of doing something that ridiculous that managed to work a few times, and then one of them ran it to the final to play the other one. So. I remember my thinking at the time is the go-to options for the second best deck are, has got to be either Japan Aggro or Britain Control to beat Japan Aggro. And I thought, why don't we just make this a rock, paper, scissors and just do US Ramp? That's going to beat Britain Control and completely lose to uh, Japan Aggro. And I decided actually at the last minute this is a terrible idea and I didn't bring Ramp myself, but... Um, Spoilers, I did not win this tournament. Um, <laughs> so, you know, maybe I should have brought Ramp. Maybe I should have brought the strategic plan in. That would have been the difference. <laughs> Clearly, I'm I'm, I'm not going to say I'm fundamentally wrong, because I'm not. It, I'm sorry, it is a terrible card. <laughs> but clearly it worked. Yeah, your, um, your analysis was on point. It's just that uh, there was control decks at the time were very much just anti-aggro, where you would just run, like, you know, on ladder, the popular deck was just four copies of 5th Regiment, four copies of Baluk Regiment. And, like, you, if your opponent strategic planning is even on a single unit, you probably just lose the game because you're playing Britain and Monsoon Rod doesn't exist yet, so how do you remove anything that has, like, yeah. more than three health? Oh, no, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I can totally see how it's amazing if you can fire it. I was just working yeah. on the principle that how much of a lunatic do you have to be to fire it? So... We've talked a bit about Britain here, um, so let's give you some uh, British cards. We have the second pair of British cards for you. We have Commonwealth versus Lendleys. These are two cards I am familiar with. So, which of these do you think saw play, or do you think they both saw play, or do you think neither saw play? All right, I, I'm just, I'm 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 not overthinking this one. Because I'm just looking at this and letting my card gamer brain go off and looking at a limited pool. In my head, like, whether both of them saw play is a harder question for me, but I have to believe that Lendley saw play because that's the draw value's not bad at all. I... I'm going to say Lendley saw play in Commonwealth didn't but i might be wrong it might be that both of them did but i i gotta believe lend least did all right so um sorry to break it to you but neither oh. of these saw cards saw any play in this tournament now that, <laughs> that that's a surprise you know that actually hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so the the common thought at the time among the top players of the game and I, I am included in this so this is as much of a burden on myself as anybody else at the time I'm, I'm kind of surprised Commonwealth didn't see play it wasn't incredibly popular on ladder um but it was popular enough on ladder especially for a Britain main so there were British control lists in this tournament and I'm kind of surprised they didn't run Commonwealth um but I think the point was that they didn't think they could reliably hit 30 Plus, without running fortification, and the thought at the time was fortification is just not good enough um, as a card. You're running too many cards that don't affect the board to run fortification and commonwealth. Um, now, the, th the thought behind Lendleys is a little harder to explain. Because at the time, Convoy was seen as like the, the like hands down best draw card in the game. You know, it's Convoy. It's three credits, draw two cards. That's insane. You run four Convoy in every single British deck, main or ally. Lendleys. However, seven credits draw four was thought of as a terrible card. Not just not good enough to run, or like there weren't decks that could utilize it. It was thought of as terrible. And I will remind you that we are still playing 10 cost Empire of the Sun as the best big draw card in the game. <laughs> this is my face, but carry on. Please, please tell me how we got here. So I think the idea was 
looking at Britain, Britain was a nation that could very easily be out-tempoed by a lot of other decks. Britain just was slow and clunky. You played these, like, low attack, high health guards and just tried to just slowly win on value by slowing your opponent down enough by playing these huge, chunky guards. So the idea of putting in a 7-cost card into any slower Britain control deck, uh, and it's a 7-cost card that doesn't affect the board in any way, it was just not thought of as Britain will ever have a situation to play this in. Now, Monty did exist, and Monty was played in every single Britain deck. Um, but... So, like, you could say, like, you could Monty Lendlease, um, you know, stall out the board and then draw four cards. But if you're playing a control deck, you're probably just running four Convoy and you're fine with that um, on card draw. And the air decks was just thought of as, like, well, you don't want to run any card that, like, costs more than five in an air deck. Because air is, like, a very aggressive strategy. You just play out, a, I don't know, a lot of cheap cards and you run your cheap card draw and Convoys as, as your hand refill. Um, and... It's really interesting because Lendlease in the future went on to be a staple in Brit Air, and one of the reasons Brit Air was so good is because you run Convoy and Lendlease, and then you never run out of cards for the entire game. Uh... <laughs> Thank the Lord that at some point I'm at least proved to have some understanding of this, because... <laughs> okay, I'm just glad that at some point someone saw yeah. it, because it, uh, it... Lendlease is really good value. It's because other nations had so little card draw, Convoy was enough to maintain card advantage against basically any deck in the game, except for decks running, like, Double Empire of the Sun. Um, and if they're running Double Empire of the Sun, they're running it as much for the card draw as for the removal. Um, yeah. Like, if you, you know, the biggest cards people were really playing had, like, five health. But So, like, if your opponent, like, slams down a Grenadier Guards, it's a 5-9, how do you remove that? Some nations don't even have ways to kill this card. While you play Empire of the Sun, you destroy it, and you draw five cards in the process. So it's like a better lead lease with then two credits destroy the biggest unit in your opponent's deck. That's pretty good. Well, at, at nine, I suppose. Um, you, you can start to see what we're thinking. Can you? Can you get into our heads? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm there in the sense <laughs> that, sure, but it's... Japan has expansion. Why do you care about a 10 cost card for late game draw? Yeah. Um. I, I, like, I'm not <laughs> on yeah. No, no. no. Game a lot longer than me. Feel but... free to flame all of us. OCC1, none of us had any idea what we're doing. And we're, that's going to become abundantly clear if it's not already. Um, but yeah, Ladley's. That one is a card people slept on for so long. I know I've talked to competitive players who, when they saw Lendlease, like, start to get picked up for the first time, assumed that it came out in a later expansion than it did. They assumed it, like, came out in Breakthrough or, or even Legions, and just, like, you know, people slept on it for, like, a month, and then were like, wait, this card's actually really good. And it's like, no, this card's been in the game for, like, two years, and just no one has ever played it. <laughs> Yeah. I'm fine. You know, I mean, I love you guys. You know, I love you guys. I'm friendly to everybody, but no, no, I, I, I am there with the this this was wild west thinking. I mean, sure, the the format's different, but the, the fundamentals apparently got punted. Yeah, and I, I suppose I forgot to mention asking if you think either of these cards have been changed, but I will just tell you both of these cards are in their same versions as when we were playing them back then. These cards have never been changed. I mean, I am deeply grateful <laughs> to find out that neither of these cards has ever been changed, because realistically, they're good enough as they are. Um, the only thing I could believe is that they used to be a bit worse. I can't believe they're ever any better, because... Ah. All right. Now we get on to Japan. And the last time we saw Japan, we looked at two Japanese removal cards. Now let's look at two Japanese one-drops. So we have... Uh, the 34th Infantry Regiment, and the Type 94 TK. I need to kill personal bias. I have an instinctive bias when I'm looking at these cards, but that's okay. And uh, something I actually haven't really been mentioning is whether these cards were in Classic or Allegiance. Um, and to say this tournament doesn't really matter, but both of these actually came out in Allegiance. So both of these are Japanese one-cost units that came out at the exact same time in the same expansion. All right. This is actually harder than I want it to be, because my personal bias makes me want to completely and utterly disregard 34th Infantry Regiment, because I personally really don't like anything that is just dis discarding my resources and my cards. I, I 
that, but that's a personal playstyle preference. Um, I know it can be good because I did a whole video on a deck that it was really good in. Um, but I've got to believe that one of these had to see some play. I'm I'm going to actually absolutely. I'm going to take a huge punt, and I'm going to say I can actually believe both of these saw play if Japan was playing aggressively, because they're both zero op cost, and I I like, I mean, surprise attack, getting an extra card, that's always a good feel, um, and it's pin, which is never bad, and I'm, I'm mostly just second-guessing myself on 34th. But no, no, I'll stick with my instinct. My instinct is that there's a good likelihood both of these saw some play. Well, you you are correct there in your analysis completely that um, one credit zero up, very strong. Now, people have been playing the game for the last, like, two, three years and probably familiar with both of these cards. Um, now, in this event, there was zero type 94 TK early. There was... Uh, well, I, I suppose I will ask you, how how much do you think there was uh, 34th regiments? Do you think this was um, like a one-off couple decks, or do you think this was uh, sort of a staple of the meta? I, I, I'm, I'm going to say, I, 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 I'm going to say 2-2, two, two, one drop has, has got to be relatively popular. I mean, one drop, zero op cost, 2-2. Two, two. It's just, it's a decent body, and clearly that's a thing at the minute, in my head anyway, if I'm reading anything that you're telling me about these mad times correctly, and now you tell me it was in, like, one deck. So, no, you you are absolutely correct. One cost, two, two, infantry, pretty good. Uh, 34th infantry was probably, I, I'm not sure if it's the most popular card in this tournament. It's definitely got to be in, like, the top three most popular cards of this tournament. And it is most certainly at this time on ladder the most common turn one play across all decks. 34th infantry, just one cost, 2-2 two, two infantry. People like the two health um, over the one health of cards like Bicycle Regiment or 15th Cavalry. Um, and obviously if you're playing Jaguar, you play both. Um, but, you know, just not dying to Sickle is pretty good because um, Soviet value is pretty common. Also, the two health keeps it alive against things like 5th Brigades, which is just huge. Getting to attack fifth brigade twice, really, really good supply shortage isn't in the meta yet. Um, so yeah, thirty fourth infantry, very popular card. Now we get to, do you think either of these cards have been changed? I'm gonna buy that. I'm gonna buy that thirty fourth is probably still the same. I mean, it's not seen at 1 1. Maybe Type 94's seen some kind of change because it is incredibly vanilla apart from the card ad. But I I'm, I, I would suggest. Okay, I, I'm going to live on the hill where I'm going to look like an idiot at the end of this video <laughs> and say that the, the infantry probably hasn't changed. I think the tank might have done. So, um, you are actually completely incorrect on this. Type 94 has never seen any change. That is the Type 94 on release, and yes, that is the Type 94 that went on to be an absolute staple three of in every single Japan deck ever, um, if you were playing the game about a year ago. However, what was changed was Surprise Attack. Surprise Attack used to be two credits, and it was kind of bad. Nobody played it. And then, in um, June 2021, so a... Or sorry, no, January 2021. So six months after this tournament, they buffed Surprise Attack, a card that had never seen any play to from two credits to one credit. And when it happened, people kind of slept on it for a hot minute. People looked at it and were like, well, one credit, this card's still kind of bad. People very briefly tried it out in Jagro and was like, this is still worse than just playing Sendai's. Uh, and I'm talking about Surprise Attack, the card. We all kind of collectively forgot about Type 94 being a card in the game that would be affected by this change for a little bit. And it really took a while for people to start running Type 94 in decks like Jagro, and it took even longer to start running it in decks like Japan Ally Air. Um, and, yeah, honestly, we, <laughs> the, the big part of that is to, uh, I don't know which players specifically, but the Chinese community as a whole, I remember in the Western community, we were Jagro, really, really popular, playing a lot of Jagro, 
and just nobody was playing Type 94s whatsoever. And increasingly, we would queue into these Chinese players running Type 94s. And at first, we were like, why are you running Type 94s? This is just a bad one drop. What, what a bad card you played in your deck. And after, like, a month or two of just getting absolutely whooped by surprise attacks, it's like, wait, no, this card's insane. <laughs> Zero off yeah. tank. It doesn't matter if it has, it's a 1-1. One -one. It doesn't matter if it has doesn't have Blitz. Zero off thing you play on turn 1. It's good. And it gives you a surprise attack. If you can pick up two of this, it's two credits. Destroy any unit in the game. Very, very good. Um, and then, uh, th that's type 94. But then we get to the story of the 30 34th Infantry Regiment. This card has been changed twice. The current version has been changed twice. Once in its wording, once in its stats. So I will first, I, I will first send you the original... Um, version. Oh, actually, I'll send you the, the second version. So this is the version that the current version was changed from. It's a difference in the card text. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Although, I've got to ask... If... No, I, I'm, I'm waiting for the rest of the story before I comment too much on what, <laughs> what to me is a very weird text change. Um... So I'm going to keep part of the story secret for now, um, because there's a deck that we are going to come back to later. Um, not in this video, but later uh, at some point. Sure. Um, but a, a part of it is to make it synergize with discard. But removing is not discarding. So because it's yeah. draw and discard, it synergizes with anything that has draw. So if you have a honey on the board, you'll gain the one HQ. Um, if you draw into a supply chain or a Betty and then discard it, you know, Betty gets played, supply chain gives you two. Um, so it was meant to change the card into a self-discard card, and it's now a self-discard staple. Um, and I am very, very proud of this because this was my suggestion. This wording is verbatim my suggestion. Um, very, very happy that this went into the game. Um, however, that is not the... Not the, the picture I've sent you is the picture of the card that we played in this tournament, because two weeks before this tournament, it was nerfed from this. insane yes so allegiance dropped and people were looking at a one cost two three remove a unit uh, remove a card from your deck every turn and you know at the time everyone was playing cavalry there were some people who looked at this card and like this seems good but like you know how good is this gonna be it doesn't have blitz it can't cut to the front line immediately for like an expansion um so there, there were some doubts, and then the first best game of the expansion, and this is something that I have only really been told about because I took a brief break from cards right after Allegiance dropped, and basically right, right, I came back right after this deck was nerfed, but it was Japan's Soviet aggro with a zero operation cost theme. There was like a sub-theme for zero operation cost things, and this card was played in the deck, but the other pieces of that deck were nerfed, um, and this was just seen as a card you ran in that deck because it had zero off. It was something with zero off that you could play early for the other synergy cards. And then people start playing Japan Soviet aggro because the deck got nerfed. But what people realized pretty quickly later was 34th Regiment is just insane. Just a one cost two three is insane. It has zero off. Like, yes, if your opponent does cavalry, they get the front line first. They can hit the face on turn two. However, if your opponent is playing anything else a 2-3 is insane because there's very limited removal there's very limited aoe's in the game 2-3 is just gonna it trades one for one with the fifth regiment it it's just an insane stat line this card was an absolute staple it was the entire meta revolved around hard mulliganing for to get 34th uh infantry to play on turn one and very often you'd play it on turn one, your opponent played on turn one, you'd play two more on turn two, they'd play two more on turn two, and you're also operating them for free, and it's just a massive trade-out of 34th Infantries. And if at any point you had one more than your opponent, you just win the game. Um, it it was a rough time, and 1939 recognized this, and they nerfed the card going into this tournament, and we all brought it anyways. Um, this card was incredible, not all of us, but this card was incredibly popular anyways, even as a 2-2. It did fall out of play eventually. Um, at a 2-2, it is much worse. It trades with 35T, it trades with 15th um, Cavalry. It just, it's not getting, it's just a slow card that's probably going to get 1 for 1 rather than a slow card that's got a 2 for 1 or 3 for 1. Um, so that is the story of the 34th Infantry. Um, also, as it turns out, um, as most players, um, <laughs> sort of like a, 
it, it turns out removing a card from your deck is not bad. Um, and this is something that I have, I have, I've tried to explain to so many people, um, that it's just not a bad effect. It's like the card is at the bottom of your deck. It does not matter unless you hit, uh, fatigue. Yeah, so really, I had a very similar conversation with a newer player to the game who was trying to understand the concept of, like, any self-discard-based deck. And as much as I personally don't like it because I find the mechanic just a bit uncomfortable and random, like, the actual, the, the maths behind it, you don't, and if you're playing a fast deck, you don't care. You're not expecting to see the bottom third of your deck anyway, so... Does it matter if it's sat in a pile or in a corner or you never brought it in the first place? Yeah, exactly. It's very natural to get stuck up on, you know, you play 34th on turn one and you see it removes Sheedon from your deck. And you're like, well, Sheedon's my biggest card. It's an elite. It's a one of. Now I don't have Sheedon anymore. That's so bad. But it's like, I mean, like half of games you don't never draw Sheedon. So yeah. now you just know that you're never going to draw Sheedon. So that actually gives you additional information. To not try yeah. to draw for sheet in a situation where you should be doing other stuff. So, 100%. I mean, it's also, it's, the, the, there are games in which, which I won't get into, the, the fact that you, you, you um, recycle resource cards into the bottom of your deck becomes a whole second form of play because you know what the bottom of your deck looks like. It, I've no problem with the idea of just pitching a card to get advantage when you're this quick. And fr frankly, I'm not going to object to pitching a card to get a one drop that's a two three. Exactly. And that's bonkers. Yeah. The the balance the balance in cards has gotten a lot better. I know we're all complaining about the, the latest um covert operations cards, but the balance has certainly gotten better, I will say. Um this to be clear, 34th was nerfed seven months after Allegiance came out. We had seven months of two three thirty fourth. <laughs> I mean, it's a time to live in, but I presume really all you saw on ladder was Japan decks running thirty fourth. Yeah, it it was a rough time. Um, now let's let's get on to Germany. Now Germany has not been present up until now. Um, in this, uh, looking through these cards, um, but Germany was present in this tournament. So here are two German cards, and you need to tell me which of these saw play. Oh, it's one of my favorite cards. I don't necessarily mean it's good, but I love Bismarck. Um, I think it's the sound effect that gets me. And then there's a card I've never seen before. Okay, so this one is going to make me look terrible, but this is really easy in my head. Like, surely both of these saw play. These are both really good cards. I mean, they're expensive. HQ damage from Bismarck is still not bad. 10 for 7, I will die on the hill that 10 for 7 when you need it is really good value. Kriegsmarine seems insane to me. I mean, I suppose if you've got someone who's emptying their hand constantly, but... No, no, I, I, I want to say, and I'm going to say, because, hey, how much more foolish can I look in a video like this? The, the I believe both of these had to make it into at least one deck in this tournament. So, um... Actually, you are completely correct. This is the one where both of these cards saw play. Um, and when they saw play, they saw play in the same deck. Um, because, as it turns out, burning the opponent in the HQ, pretty, pretty good. Um, there's also some there's some weird stuff you can do with Kriegsmarine. I'm not saying it saw play in this tournament, necessarily. But there's some things you can do with Kriegsmarine where you play a deck with a lot of retreat cards um, to make sure this card's in their hand. You can run this. Um, as just another card in a discard package, which you're not necessarily going to get the most HQ damage out of this, um, but it does say discard, which is pretty relevant if you're stacking draw to dial and discard effects. And you can also do this with um, France Resistance, where you are filling their hand to the max with resistance cards, and then you creeps bring them for nine. Um, and obviously there's a chance you discard a resistance card, but you're, you're hitting them for nine for seven, um, which is a bit better than ten for seven. Or you're hitting them for, yeah. Uh, seven for ten, yeah. I should say. Um, so yeah, both of these saw play. Now, do you think these saw play in one of, or, or in a couple of decks, or do you think this was part of the meta? No, I'm I judging by what you've said, and I am I am being very judgmental of you all in a very <laughs> positive way. 
I'm gonna say this this was probably relatively niche. This was probably someone who built a very specific deck and maybe one or two people brought a very heavy burn deck, which I'm thinking might have been Germany, France, but hey, you tell me. So, um actually, Kriegsmarine and Bismarck were incredibly popular, both in this tournament and on ladder. On ladder you were getting Kriegsmarine and Bismarck twenty four seven. And this is why cards like Baluk Regiment were much more popular on ladder than in this tournament. I, I still would have imagined people would have brought this to this tournament. And this is really weird, because Fortification was not present in this tournament, as far as I'm aware, at least not more than like a one-of. Um, and it was not that popular on ladder. And I don't really understand why, looking back on it. I understand that you can't really run Commonwealth, because so many people are playing enough burn that you're not going to be able to get to 30. They're just going to keep burning you below 30. However, if your opponent's... Yeah, I'll, give you, I'll give you that <laughs> one, but but why are you not paying the pay some credits and avoid the burn card? If a huge chunk of the player base is running 10 credits deal 7 damage, and you're playing Britain, why don't you run a 3 credit heal 7? Is beyond it... me. I really don't know looking back on it. <laughs> It, it, it is, this is, I will admit, this is part of what, as I said, your previous conversation was part of what led me to think this is probably a niche deck. Because I'm on, surely, <laughs> if if both of these are seeing regular play, you, who is not running Fortification in Britain and anything else you can get a hold of? Because these two cards in your deck, especially in Germany, France, if it comes up against you, could do, like, you be taking... 17 damage off these relatively easily why would you not run fortification and really everything else you can find that gives you hq defense yeah well at this point in the game us had we can do it and it, it saw some play um japan had no healing cards that people played um and germany had no healing cards period and soviets had like two cards that would heal and they, they saw play, but there was not a huge access to healing in Soviet. Britain was the only nation that really had any reasonable amount of healing, so it turns out cards that straight deal damage to the enemy HQ are pretty good, because odds are they will never heal over the course of a game, unless they're playing Britain. Um, so, with all that being said, do you think either of these cards have been changed? Do you think we were playing 10 credit Bismarck or 7 credit Kriegsmarine, either buffed or nerfed? I'm fairly confident of my answer on Bismarck. Kriegsmarine is really hard to evaluate because it's so dependent on the deck you're playing it in. So, okay, let's let's say I I would suggest that maybe both of these. Like, I want to believe Bismarck's seen a nerf at some point. Kriegsmarine. I'm just gonna say it's probably the same as it's always been. So, actually, both of these cards are completely the same as they have always been. Neither of these cards have ever been changed. We were playing 10-cost Bismarck back in the day. In the first ever OCC, there was a lot of 10-cost Bismarck lying around. And they never really needed to be nerfed. Um, because the fact that we were playing them at their current costs shows that, like, you know, they, they certainly didn't need to be buffed. Um, we were playing them at that. Like, the burn was that good back in the day. And it never really needed to be nerfed because people pretty quickly on, like, only a couple of months after this tournament, people were just, the meta was, like, three or four turns faster easily. Like, the average game was not going to turn 10. Um, so even if you are yeah. playing an aggressive deck, you're just not playing Bismarck. Also, very importantly, Honey came out, like, three weeks after this tournament. Um, so that might have played a role in people not playing Bismarck <laughs> and Kriegsmarine as much. Yeah, I mean, I'm not following gonna lie, that. <laughs> but Honey's gonna be a game changer at that point because the, we all know how good Honey is. Um, and if if you're seeing this, that makes sense. I can I can, I can believe that they stayed the same. I kind of I just you know I, I'm very aware that sometimes early in development things are a little bit too strong but i can see why they'd stay the same there's like neither of them i by my looking at right now and thinking this card is utterly broken yeah it's it's very interesting i think 1939 was very very afraid of burn 
and not very afraid of mana cheating when looking at old cards. Um, like, just any ver any form of mana cheating, often you look at it and you're like, this was the original, like, this was the card you printed? This card looks insane. And then any card that used to burn you look at, even if it's been nerfed, you look at old burn cards and you're like, this is, probably wouldn't see any play today. It's just really, really cost inefficient. And part of that is just we've gotten much more access to healing. Uh, and, and an efficient healing, like look at Glamour Boys. <laughs> if Glamour Boys it was in the game, we would be playing that. Um, yeah, I'll give you that one. <laughs> Alrighty, so next up, we have our first of the uh, two ally nations that were introduced in uh, Allegiance, which was Italy and France. That was sort of the, one of the big selling points of Allegiance, is it's Card's first big expansion, and we're bringing in France and Italy to try out the new nations. Um, and each of these nations had sort of two somewhat separate strategies that were pushed um so i have selected a card from the two different italian strategies you could feasibly run um and you need to tell me which of these do you think saw play we, we've passed the gimmicky ones we've seen the two cards that have seen play the two cards that both didn't see play so one of these two did actually see play in this tournament one card i'm familiar with one card i i know exists um <laughs> And then I'm scrolling through Italy and seeing where they're going with this. And then I'm not going to lie, I'm keyword searching. Hmm. An interesting one. Um, I, my first instinct was, all right, so Alpine's here and it's 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 progressive and, and it has exponential gain. But, but then I googled Alpine and there's like one German Alpine unit. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just... So really, it's, you know, you've got your Italian units, and that's it. Um, that said, you know, you can do something with it, but... But then on the other hand, I'm looking at, at that... It's the value... No, I'm going to trust my value instincts here. I'm going to say Alpine was just too new, so I'm going to say that if... if and we, we know one of these saw play. I'm going to say that the, the one that most likely saw play would have been Bologna. So, um, actually, the the one that saw play was Eastern uh... Frontbound. Um, we did see um, Alpine in this tournament. How much Alpine do you think we saw? Do you think Alpine was meta? Were people running their Kriegsmoon and Bismarcks in Alpine? Or do you think Alpine was a bit more niche? <laughs> <laughs> No, Al <laughs> this point, Al is, I, is, I, I mean, I am going to look like an idiot at the end of this sentence, but at this point, that it's there's no way that both Burn and Alpine are meta at the same time. Alpine's got to be something that someone brought because they found a way to get value out of it. Maybe a couple of decks, but I would have thought possibly even just one good Alpine would have seen play. So... Alpine saw a limited amount of play. There was two Alpine decks in the tournament, and I brought one of them. I don't recall if I had the Bismarck Kriegsmoon package in the deck. I doubt it. Um, I probably would have focused more on removal. Um, but again, I don't have access to the lists. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, but I want to say I hope not, because <laughs> you and I would need a conversation <laughs> just about whatever was going on in your life back then that would make you make that choice. Um, so... I, I had Alpine, and the one other player who had Alpine, if I recall correctly, was in fact Blue Blast, who, again, got second in the tournament. He had Alpine and Ram. Uh, he, he was cooking. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't lie, Alpine's... People are always doing it. I keep trying it. Every time a new expansion comes out, I'm, I'm on Can I Make Alpine Work, and every time I'm bitterly disappointed. Yeah, I mean, it's a meta where you don't have Depth of Winter, you don't have Monsoon Rots, Cobra Bomb's, mm. like, the biggest AoE. Um, there's To the Last Man and then Cobra Bomb. That's that's sort of the step down in the next AoE. <laughs> so, yeah, so it, I mean, exponentially big yeah. bodies has got to have value. If you play Alpine on one and your opponent passes on one and then you play a second Alpine and they play a fifth brigade, you're winning that game. <laughs> yeah. um, now, do you think either of these cards have been changed? I'm going with my gut here. I just flipped up the cards, looked at it, and went, I want to believe that... I want to believe both of these have probably seen change, but I'm going to say the reasoning why 
And that's because both of these are going into what looks like very different territory for cards at the time. And generally, designers have got to be very on point to drop cards like this and then never see change on them. So I'm going to say in the time they've been in, surely they've seen at least a little bit of change. So you are correct. Both of these cards saw change. And one was the Eastern Front Bound. Um, and this was a big reason why... One of two reasons Alpine was brought by myself and Blue Blast was this was the former Eastern Front Bound, um, which I've just sent to you. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Now I see why it doesn't matter that there was only one German Alpine unit in the game. Who printed this card? Yeah. So... Question, did the copy go into your hand with the buff or without it? Without the buff. Good. I mean, it's insane enough as it is, because of course you play it and you're proccing yet more Alpine buff, but okay, that's insane. So that actually interests me, because this card never saw any play. Ever. This card was looked at as laughably bad. And I never played Alpine until this was changed. So I can't say if it was really good or really bad, but I find it very interesting that you think this is really good now. Because um, I honestly haven't really thought about this card super critically, the, the old version, because I wasn't playing Alpine prior to the, the change. Just, just to get marginally extemporaneous, I'm just like, because you can, you know, you can always cut stuff later, but no, I mean, so forecast, fine. It's not cheap. However, we're talking about a relatively... Yeah. A meta in which big bodies, as we've just discussed, could be very, very useful. It's it, Plus one, plus one is never a bad buff. Add a copy of an Alpine unit to your hand when you deploy an Alpine unit and it gets a buff from the Alpine units that you've already got. I don't... Like, I, I'm sure everybody has their own thing, but... And I know card draw is, you know, card draw, but I cannot imagine this... I'm astounded. But then, I mean, given everything that we've just discussed, some of you guys were smoking something back then. Yeah, so um, honestly, this, now this I'm very interested. Smoking. I'm very interested. Maybe we were all sleeping on old Eastern Front Band. Um, but the reason it was changed, it was considered a massive buff because nobody was playing this card. Um, and then they changed it. Everyone was like, whoa, Alpine just got changed. Like two weeks before the tournament. And in the same patch, they nerfed several cards in the most popular German deck. So it's like the most popular way to build Germany just got nerfed and they just buffed Alpine and Germany is the only reasonable nation you can run a, an Alpine deck at this point with. So it's like, whoa, is Alpine great? Are we cooking? Are we headed for a new Alpine meta? We were not at this time. Um, but it wasn't that bad. Like it was good, but the problem is if your opponent played 34th into 35T and went first, you, they'd play a 2-2 two -two and then with zero op and then you'd play a 1-2 with one op and then they'd play 35-T and kill it and then push up their 2-2 two -two because it's zero op and now you've lost the game on turn two. Um, so, you know, <laughs> was it the best yeah, I mean, thing to be do honest, with yeah. Germany? Probably not, but... It... <laughs> no, I mean, let's be honest, that's not changed for Alpine, <laughs> basically, because it's still the same problem. Alpine is great in principle, but it's so slow. Yeah. That, that, that's exactly it. Is You can just, if you go second against an aggro deck, you're, it's probably lights out already. Um, now, Bologna Regiment also saw some change. This was the version of Bologna Regiment on release and at the time of this tournament. Checking the different. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's a 3 7 guard for 3. I mean, yes, it costs one more. To... Fine. Lovely. But. I mean, 3-7 guard for 3 is not a bad body. 3-6 is a little more reasonable. I still think it's decent value, but I don't think it's... It's not setting the world on fire? So... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If the issue was with this card was primarily there was nothing else to support Italian control. Italian control didn't really get cards until the next expansion. So you kind of had, like, you had Bologna... Um, and then you had, like, what What else are you doing? You can be running Japan with your Empire of the Suns. Why are you playing Bologna Regiment? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Because, yeah, I, when I flipped through Italy, when they, again, looking at the guard, I was like, so what control tools do, does Italy have? And I'm like, well, I, I mean, there's human torpedo, I suppose. Like, yeah. Um, it, bizarre. So it got it got buffed um, not too long after this tournament, February 2021. So I, I suppose about eight months later, it got buffed because nobody was playing this. And it was around the same time they were releasing new Italian control cards and they wanted to support Italian control as a new archetype. So it got changed to this, um, which turned out to be very, 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 very good and very, 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 very popular. <laughs> That's, that is not a small buff. Yeah. So That's really <laughs> strong. Essentially, if you don't get it on turn three, if you get it on turn three, they're both three cost three seven guys, and they're both really, really good. Now, if you don't get it on turn three, instead of being like a 20 cost guard you could never play, it's capped at a four cost three seven guard, which is still really, really good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's still really good value. Again, I point at Glamour Boys. Um, yeah, the, the, there's no downside to this, because what it says is either you get this card for basically what is slightly above curve value in my head although i still haven't broken down the maths properly in cards because it's complicated versus ludicrously cheap <laughs> yeah so it was it existed like that in the game uh for about a year and a half and then it was changed in june 2022 to its current version um and it was it was a nerf um However, the reason they did it was also because at the time they got rid of, in that patch, they got rid of every single card that would change cost well in your deck because they kept creating bugs and they just got sick of trying to squash those bugs every single patch. So they were like, we're just going to change every single card that changes cost in your deck to now only change cost in your hand to stop complicating things. And this yeah. is the, the treatment um, that Bologna got. And it continued to see play after that change. Um and I'm sure if Italian control ever comes back, there's a good chance it will come back with Bologna. Yeah, because, I mean, it's still, like, you, there is a risk, but it's not world-breaking. And it's still a decent value guard. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that way, like, if, if it's an always an option. It's really a... I've, I played a decent amount of draft and picked a decent amount of Italy in draft, because it was the fun thing to do back then. I remember always drafted the Bologna regiment in the original version, and you'd, like, draw it on, like, turn 20 of draft and it would like actually cost like 27 credits to play <laughs> it would just be like i didn't draw a card this turn that's fun uh, <laughs> that's fine i've got this piece of art which i will look at for the rest of the game while my opponent is taking their turn and uh then we have we'll move on to france um and do france next and we'll look at two cards uh, of, again, different strategies for France that came out in this expansion. We have Call to the Colonies and I mean the Resistance, both of which are actually currently still in the game. And one of which sees play. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just saying. Uh, I like France. I'm playing around with a lot of um, France ally decks currently. Um, not saying they're good, but they are fun. Um, okay, so how much of you did we get on release? All right, I'm going out on a limb because I just, I looked and I just had a look at what was available with the resistance on it. And if you, if you halfway concentrate on this, that you can flood your opponent's hand. So I'm going to believe arming the resistance or play. Not necessarily a lot, but we'll get to that later. But I'm going to believe of these two, Arming the Resistance saw play. You are absolutely correct. Arming Resist the Resistance was played as a two-of card in this event. But, like, as a two cards in a deck. Um, yeah. Do you think this was a staple of the meta, or do you think this was just one guy going out there? I think this was the, I think this was the, the other half of insane Germany burning people to death. So, this was in fact only run as a one person brought france and it was I... japan france resistance and it was the winner of the tournament Ari big man and what's actually really interesting about this is uh japan france resistance it was 
not a completely unheard of deck, um, but it was a deck that was not particularly popular, was not perceived to be particularly good at the time. Um, and then there was a whole bunch of um, changes to a bunch of the cards that was run in the deck over time. And it, this was June 2020. So fast forward about a year and a half to, say, let's September, October 2021. And RE Big Ben once again qualifies to a tournament and brings Japan Trans Resistance. And at this point, it was a it had been a staple, like t low tier two deck that he wasn't the first person to bring it to a tournament after this one. Um, and the big difference is he built his deck very, very differently than everyone else. Everyone else was they were trying to play guards, they were they were doing different pieces of removal. He basically built his deck like a combo deck. It, the, it, the curve was ludicrously low. It was entirely orders. There was like four units in the entire deck. And basically his goal was to maximize the draw potential off of Pony War um, and just get through your deck as quickly as possible and then win with last fights and try to combo out on like about turn 12 or so. It was essentially just a combo deck. And he saw it and he didn't do well that well in the tournament, I don't think. But I looked at the list and was like, Ari Big Ben is a genius. And I basically took the list almost one for one and I played it in, I, I played some practice matches with it and was like, this deck is insane. I need to keep this deck under wraps. So I didn't play it in any events as far as I remember. I only played it with a small practice group of players. And then I cracked it out in the uh, OCC World Championships with my practice partner, Darkness. And lo and behold, that is how we get the legendary 2021 Cards World Championship Grand Final Game 5 all on the line Japan-France Resistance Mirror Match. <laughs> That led to the deck being nerfed into the ground because the devs never, ever, ever wanted that to be the face of Cards Esports ever again. Um, so yeah, it's a very long way, but this is where we started with Japan France Resistance, and you can thank RE Big Ben. <laughs> Confession? I've watched the VOD of that match. I loved it. <laughs> I can totally understand why they nerfed it to the ground because you have to be a very particular kind of person to enjoy watching that game. And I mean, no offense to you or Darkness, but you have to be a very particular <laughs> kind of person. So I was, I was not here to hear this, um, obviously, because I was playing the game. But I have heard from Innocent Bubbles, who was sitting in the crowd with a number of the devs, that the I think the lead chief executive officer or a creative officer of the company sitting next to bubbles watching game five of that tournament and well midway through the game was just like we need to destroy this deck how are we destroying this deck and immediately started talking to the other devs around him on the best way to make sure this deck never saw play again <laughs> it was, i'm not it was a beautiful thing to watch for a particular kind of person <laughs> yeah i think they were kind of Part of it was definitely that they were worried that Japan-France Resistance was going to become the new night, which is where every single open tournament would have a Japan-France versus a Japan-France and the game would last an hour because both players are roping every turn and then passing, and the games never end. Um, but that is all getting quite ahead of us uh, from the first ever OCC, where Japan-France Resistance was somewhat of a novelty. Um, do you think either of these cards have seen any change? I'm going to go with... I only think one of these is likely to have seen change, and I'm going to say it's arming the resistance. I kind of like Call to the Colonies where it is, and I'm kind. I want to believe that the developers are, are good enough that it probably landed balanced at the time because I like it as it is now. I play a lot, so yeah, I believe arming the resistance though probably has seen change, if not changes. So, actually, Call to the Colonies on release cost five, and it never saw any play. No one even considered it. They were because at the time. On release, France was only considered as an ally for Britain. And if you're playing Britain, why are you playing a five-cost call to the colonies? You have convoy and you have fortification. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it actually stayed at five and saw zero play um, until January 2021. So about six months later, they, they put it down to four. And it didn't see immediate play. But we were running three copies of Call to the Colony, or at least two copies of Call to the Colonies, in the Japan-France Resistance deck by the end of 2021. Um, so that was a big part, was just giving Japan-France more healing to play the on an, an uninteractive solitaire strategy of the deck. You just give them an additional 24 healing, why not? Um, yeah. Now, I mean, the Resistance, on the other hand, 
has not ever been changed. That is the version on release. However, what was changed was every single resistance card other than Armin the Resistance. <laughs> like the only one that survived. Okay, I can believe that. Hey guys, sorry for the interruption, but uh, I'm just here editing the video and while doing, while looking for some of the resistance cards to show, I actually realized that Armin the Resistance was in fact changed. Uh, something I had not realized at the time of recording this with Bear. On release, Armin the Resistance and Liberation were uh, three cost and six cost respectively. It was changed just two days after the expansion released. Um, and then it proceeded to stay at four credits for the rest of time. Um, so the quick correction to what I previously said that was wrong. And uh, these are the only images uh, I could find. Well, this was the only image of the original three cost Armin the Resistance I could find. So um, anyways, I I enjoy the rest of this clip. So uh, I now realize that I don't have this on hand to show you, it will be in the video. But, um, I, so I, I've had to, uh, quickly try to find the, the changed versions of the other resistance cards. I've already been, managed to pull up two of the three, but that gets it across. So these are the cards that Ari Big Ben was running in his deck. So Vive La Resistance used to add two copies for two, rather than one copy for one. And Liberation used to read... Fill their entire hand with resistances, heal five. Didn't matter if their hand was zero yeah. cards or eight cards. <laughs> yeah, I just did the face is me <laughs> having literally just opened the liberation screenshot that you sent me. Who on earth thought this was a good idea? Yeah, so I have very, very fond memories of playing Jagro, having emptied my hand by turn six, my opponent plays liberation. I do not draw a card. I have nine resistance cards in my hand. I play out six of them because I have nothing else to do on my turn. And then they play Vivla Resistance, I mean the resistance. And now I have nine two cost resistances. So I play three of them and then they play second, I mean the resistance. And I have a nine card hand of four cost resistance. And I haven't drawn a card in three turns. <laughs> I'm just going to take your deck away. <laughs> yeah. Also, you cut off. resistance used to read remove a card, the top card of your deck. There was not the choice to deal one damage or remove the card from your deck. Um, okay. <laughs> yes, you just did not get to play the game. <laughs> it really is just, no. I, I, I got my cards out, and now I shall finish my combo while you sit quietly in the corner. And the, uh, the infantry that adds the um, resistance card, it used to be a 2-3. It only added one, but it used to be a 2-3. Uh, so Ari Big Ben was running four copies of that. It was just the full resistance package. We had four Vives, four of the infantry, two Army the Resistance, two Liberations. That's 12 French cards. It's all 12 resistance cards in the game at the time. Yeah. And you just did that. Um, and he also ran some wild other cards in his deck. Um, but I'll save those for future videos because those were later used in other decks. Um, but I will say a big part of the reason I think nobody played this was... In the June 2020 patch that came out two weeks before the tournament and saw a big meta change, one of the changes was to Kamikaze, um, the cards generated by Last Rites. And the change was to make them go from zero credits to one credit. And the Japan-France Resistance deck was built around Kamikaze. You would just play Resistance to draw through your deck as quickly as possible, you would just play all of the draw cards you could. He ran two Empire of the Suns in this deck, of course. Um, and you would get down to the bottom of your deck. You'd play Last Rites to put eight Kabakasis on top of your deck. And then the next turn, you'd do Siren, Siren, and then play all eight Kabakasis because Kawadishi wasn't in the game yet. So we had Kawadishi at home, which was playing two Sirens. Um, <laughs> so I, I fully recommend going and watching the video of that game. Um, it's really, really awful. It's... It's incredibly uninteractive, and actually he lost the game in the finals because he got played it against the strategic planning ramp. That was my favorite game of this tournament to watch because Ari Big Ben on the Japan France just destroys like 20 cards out of Blue Blast's deck. He pins everything for like seven turns in a row, and Blue Blast simply just waits until he plays strategic planning and then hits face with like a, you know, a 10-18 Grenadier Guards. <laughs> into a deck which really has nothing to answer it at all because it doesn't expect to have to answer anything ever 
yeah so uh that that was the the, the grand finals game that that was uh quite a lot of fun to watch but Ari big ben then clutched out the tournament so that's what people were doing with france france was really only resistance and that was sort of the big complaint with allegiance is italy's only viable strategy was alpine and france's only viable strategy was resistance and there was really nothing else you could do every card that was not resistance or alpine sucked um yeah <laughs> for these two nations and that's something they kind of struggled with um later with poland but i think with finland they they got some some good choices um for like finland, finland. like you know, when finland came out it felt like i with no offense meant to the developers because i know how hard the job is it felt like a fully considered idea because there were a couple of decent things you could do with finland and it fitted into lots of different decks in an interesting way it introduced a new mechanic which was annoying but not terribly irritating or problematic i liked it i thought it was a really really good release but i can see why people would have just looked at it i mean it, it took me like five seconds to flip through the, the france orders and go now nah, it's got to be resistance because that's that's insane <laughs> It's like the only thing France can do, but it's a thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, we we are down to our final two pairs, um, and the one we're going to look at next is Soviets. And Ooh, I'm excited. Now. We've we've looked at the fatigue Soviet cards. If you remember back to the the beginning of this, one of the first things we looked at, and with those two cards, they let you know that Soviet control was a deck being played. These likewise will show you that. Soviet tokens was a deck being played in this tournament. The question is, which of these cards was Soviet tokens running? This is just the face of someone making sure I haven't misread a card. If Soviet tokens was only running one of these cards, surely it was Men of Steel. There's, it's a very interesting question why we weren't running both. I will say that. <laughs> I, I, it is my next question, but I was saving it for when you have explained whether I am correct or incorrect in my assumption, because I'm looking at this and going, are you insane? But that'll come up when we get to where the cards have changed. But I've got to believe that being able to throw heavy armor onto your tokens has got to be strong. So, in fact, you are correct. Heavy armor, uh, Men of Steel, was the card that was played in this event. How many copies do you think saw play? How much tokens do you think was there? Was this a niche or was this a staple of the meta? I mean, you've talked about the meta enough to know that, that everybody liked speed right now. I don't, I don't know how far I'd go to staple, but I think this probably saw more than niche play. So, this is an interesting card. There was, there was three tokens decks brought to this tournament, and at least two of them played Men of Steel. I think all three played Men of Steel, but I can't be positive about that. Um, now, do you think these cards have been changed? Are these the versions that existed in the game at the time? I, I mean, straight up, if, if you guys were not playing both of these at the same time, something has to have changed, but I, ca I can't tell you what, because as, as they read now, why would you not run both? So, I mean, men of Men of Steel maybe might have gotten, I, I have to believe at some point it got a nerf. Um, and presumably close combat must have been either more expensive or worse. So, close combat is exactly the same on release. This is this card is, is in the base set. This is one of the first cards they designed, and it has never been changed. Um, I had to go back to, like, alpha to find, and it used to cost one in alpha. Um, <laughs> and they changed in, like, 2018, and that's the last time this card was changed. Um, now, Men of Steel, on the other hand, was buffed in this same June 2020 balance patch. This, and it has never been changed since then. So the version you are looking at now is the version we were playing at the time. And I will uh, quickly send you the original version, the version on release. This isn't an allegiance. This is an allegiance card. It used to read this. So the operative <laughs> word here is this turn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is, I mean, that's it. That is the only thing that matters in the change. So... I'm not positive I have ever once seen Man of Steel used to remove heavy armor from a unit. Um, the only heavy armor unit that was seen play that I can think of were Tiger 1E and Panther G, which both read cannot be targeted by orders. Those are the only two cards with heavy armor that I can think of that saw any play whatsoever. 
Um, so Men of Steel was buffed two weeks before this event. And before this, Tokens was not really played. Tokens, like, you know, some people just like to play Tokens, but Tokens was not a, a deck you saw competitively from top players. In fact, it, back in the day, Ranked used to show the most played nation of every player um, in Field Marshal in the top 100. It would show their most played nation that month next to their um, HQ. Mm-hmm. And nobody made top 40 with Soviets. Sorry, top 40 with Soviets in the year of 2020, the entire 12 months, one player made top 40 with Soviets across the 12 months. Um, and in cards history, I think the most played Soviets has won the season twice in like 50 seasons of cards. <laughs> Soviets are just never and have never been that popular of a ladder deck. And even if they are, they're just not popular enough to be reaching the top echelons just because of the nature of good Soviet decks are typically slower. Um, yeah. So for this event, Men of Steel was just buffed, and one credit, give all your units heavy armor. It looks insane. Heavy armor is an insane keyword, and looking at how it's costed on units that have heavy armor, it, 1939 thinks it's an insane keyword as well. And we all thought that Men of Steel was going to be broken, and that Tokens was going to be the next best deck. Uh, well, at least this was my thought, and two other people presumably also thought the same, because they brought it to this tournament. We thought... This, you, you're going to have your best deck, and then you're going to have tokens. And that didn't really work out too well. Um, now, the token decks, they performed all right. They performed slightly below average. And when people finally ended on a version of tokens, in the end, it didn't really run Men of Steel. Because the issue was, your opponent would just trade down all of your tokens as soon as they were played, before you could get any buffs off. And if you could get any buffs off, it didn't really matter about having heavy armor, because they would just sort of trade out um and a 1-1 with heavy armor sucked um because everything has to attack so the issue is you would need to have play heavy armor and also buff them and at that point your opponent is either going all face for the rest of the game or they play carpet bombing and in either way heavy armor doesn't matter um yep that's fair so it, it ended up not being that good of a card but for this brief window it was tried out and people were really really excited about this card um and yeah it just didn't really work out close combat I'm not entirely sure, because Close Combat is a card that's s- sort of a staple in tokens now. It's a card that has seen, is at least a one-off in basically every tokens deck, because it's essentially a Blitzkrieg for tokens. Um, I have to imagine the reason we weren't playing this card at the time was probably just because of the sheer amount of buffs you were played in your deck, you just sort of snowballed on board, because there was no board resets. So if you got a board of tokens to the front line, you would just play, like, alliance or we could do it or frontal assault or something else and why would you wait for close combat whereas now where you need to be able to turn two tokens into a threat um yeah it matters more that's my guess but honestly at the time i brought tokens to the stern but i was one of the token players i would just was like i have an idea of what the token deck looks like from what other people play and i want to put man of steel in it that was the extent of which i thought i was not particularly good at deck building at this time i did not critically think, well, maybe I should put Combat Assault in my deck, even if other people aren't playing it. Um, so, yeah, that that was Tokens. Uh, that's what Tokens was doing. And then this brings us to the last, um, the last two cards we're going to look at, and these are two pieces of early game German removal, or at least cheap German removal. Um, we have Joint Operation and Tactical Strike. Which of these do you think saw play in this tournament? It's so weird, because I know for a fact now, because we've been through everything else, that I know only one of these saw play, which makes it remarkably hard to separate the two of them, because Joint Operation has the potential to do a lot of damage. I'm going to, right, I'm going to openly declare that I have an instinct, and I am deliberately going against it, because I think I'm approaching things from far too advanced a thought process for when we're talking about here. My natural instinct is that Tactical Strike would have seen play, but I'm going to believe it was Joint Operation because people were in, were liking the idea of exponential value. I'm curious, uh, can you share a little bit uh, your why your natural instinct is Tactical Strike? Because Tactical Strike for for people who are like looking at this obviously you can see the text it's um, two damage to a unit four damage if it's in the support line there are four cards in this game that are still in this game now and were in this game then that are 
or defense support line cards that are exponential increases theoretically one of them is unfortunately the slack door knuckle dragging cousin of the other three um exponential increases to the main nation's capability and tactical strike for three cost remove nakshub or pioneers is such good value and you can also do two damage to all sorts of other really irritating things that was that's where my natural instinct is because it just it deletes what can be archetype driving cards and gives you decent value beyond it but i'm thinking as i say that joint operation might have been more attractive because people might have been running more kind of combined arms type decks so actually you are completely spot on here um joint operation was the card that saw play here and the reason tactical strike like tactical strike can take out the zero force um which is really really important however at this time um, Flam Panzer and Sudden Strike were both pretty popular options. Um, so dealing with the Zero Force was less important. Um, and just three cost for a piece of removal was a little bit too much for people's liking. Um, because German decks tended towards the mid-range to fast side of the spectrum. Um, now, Joint Operation specifically though, do you think this was a niche or do you think this was a staple? I'm gonna go staple for all of the reasons that I've just said. I just, I think the thinking is gonna be this just has the potential to be such good value removal. So you are absolutely correct. Joint Op was a three of in I'm pretty sure every single German deck in this tournament, and it was very popular on ladder. Um, now, do you think either of these cards have been changed in the current versions I'm showing you, or do you think we had worse tactical strike, which is why people didn't pick it up, or do we have better Joint Op, which is why people were playing? Or did we have worse joint op and we were playing it anyways? <laughs> you never know. So, I, 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 taking advantage of what I suspect, either your Freudian slip or cunning ploy in mentioning the cost of tactical strike makes me want to believe that it probably has never been changed because the only thing that I would change on this would be the cost on it. Joint operation, I do wonder whether people were lunatic enough that this was one cost. I want to be wrong, but I'm going to say <laughs> it's it possible that joint operation was one cost. So, you are correct in that um, joint operation was previously better, and that tactical strike has not really been changed. It, the version exi that existed in the game at the time is the version we have now. It was technically changed like a month or two into me starting the game in like may 2020 or 2019 um it used to cost four and draw a card and then it went to four cost doesn't draw a card and then that sucked and they very quickly changed it to three cost doesn't draw a card <laughs> <laughs> sorry at four cost doesn't draw a card that is <laughs> yeah it was it was pretty bad there was a there was a patch where they basically reworked every single piece of commonly played removal in the game because they wanted to completely restructure how removal existed in the game and one of the things was switching the card draw from tactical strike off of tactical strike to sky dance um which yeah. ended up being a very good call in my opinion <laughs> um however that was much much before this um this was the version of joint operation that we had to play with in the expansion um this is the only image i could find of it and it's really small so sorry if you have to squint that's all right i can zoom <laughs> it in but um uh, it's it's worse than that. He's dead, Jim. Um. Okay. So, uh, feel free to explain to the YouTube audience who might not be able to read this card or might not want to read this card. What what is the difference between this joint hop and the joint hop we have now? I mean, hypothetically, it's absolutely tiny because it's basically a single operative. Which is the difference between deal damage to a target unit equal to one plus the number of unit types you control, which is, you know, still not terrible, and deal damage to target enemy equal to one plus the number of unit types you control, which is ludicrous in a game in which burn is a thing. It can target HQ. What were the devs smoking? Yeah. So... This is begins to this, this fills in the picture. This is why I saved joint operation for last, um, because it fills in the picture of what people were doing in this tournament. You were playing your Kriegsmarines, you were playing your Bismarcks, and you were playing your three stack of joint operations. Joint operation. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah. Joy Top used to be really, really popular, and you would play this. Um, it was, this was one of the reasons why 34th was really good, is you'd play your 34th on turn 1, you'd play your, like, 35T on turn 2, and then you Joint Operation is a 2-cost, deal 3 damage to anything your opponent played, or you just save it in your hand as, like, a 2-cost 3 to the face in the future. Yeah. Um, you would just kind of snowball out your opponents very, very quickly. They ended up changing this card in September 2020, so just two months after this tournament, um, just because... This card was really, really popular, and then they nerfed the decks it was played in, and then it was really, really popular, and then they nerfed the decks it was played in a second time, and then it was still really, really popular, and they were just like, okay, we gotta just kill the card. <laughs> I was gonna say, at some point, presumably, someone then read the card and went, oh, that's why. Yeah. Um, and in its current version, it has seen, i pretty sure, zero tournament play since then. Um, but there's people on the fringes of competitive who are trying to make this card work. Combined arms as a strategy didn't really exist until about a year ago, um, at, at least as an effective strategy, which is odd because the card combined arms has never been changed. Um, <laughs> we just weren't playing it back then. Um, yeah. But yeah, Joy Top, maybe one day will come back in the sun. I've, I've heard people suggest um, making it be able to hit the HQ again now that there's more healing in the game. I kind of hope they don't do that. Um, I let's, hope you just let's not let's let's <laughs> yeah. maybe buff it a different way. Let's maybe even go to my original lunacy, and if we do want to buff it, maybe make it cheaper. Yeah. But let's not ever, please. I mean, at, at one credit, it's kind of comparable to a um. It's comparable, to, I suppose, to an air superiority with one credit. Yeah, that's three damage the, of where I was going. Yeah. Um. So yeah, if they want to do that, they could definitely do that. I think. They probably don't want to do that just because combined arms strategies have been seen more play in the last year or so um, without this card, so giving them an extra piece. Um, probably not necessary. But that brings us to the end of the pairing cards. So now you have an idea of what we were doing in this tournament, who the, the, who the characters were, what our strategies were, what the cards in the meta were. And now I want to end out on giving you a list, the, the number of each 0-4 card um, I'm actually glad you brought them up previously, because the zero fours um, in the game, they, they accentuate each main nation's general primary strategy. Um, and they're very, very common, and, you know, they've, they've been in the game since the very inception of the game. Now, I'm going to give you five numbers. Each corresponds to the number of each, to a zero four for the number played in this tournament, and you need to try to guess which number goes with which card. So uh, I will type out the numbers. Um, because I can't see every single list, um, some of these numbers are assumed based on what decks people were playing, um, just assuming that they would run these cards in it, even if I can't verify that for a fact. But your numbers are 94210. And I will remind you that the reason there's nine, there's eight people in this tournament, but one person brought two decks of the same nation um because that was something you could do uh so nine four two one zero what were people doing all right so i'm gonna believe because it just in my head just makes sense because it it, it seemed to be a thing at the time that the the one that is being played most often probably going to be first signals if people are really loving this let's just throw because i can imagine that's going to be a thing on ladder and we know we've, we've got the the infantry and if you're going to be trading out anyway hq damage is good unless it's been significantly changed i'm i'm, I'm going to go with my own personal <laughs> bias here and just live with it and believe that jasco just didn't see play because it's terrible and unless it was very different i can't imagine it would have done the other three are harder um yeah i will say none of these cards have been um reworked at least in terms of their general the, the general things that they're doing yeah um back in the day way before i joined but when max was released it used to discard cards um or it used to be like when you discard a card to draw a card or like when you make the opponent discard draw a card. It did something to do with discarding like very, very yeah. long time ago, but that, that's gone. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's where it lives now in the in the, the let's just embrace credit cheating. Um which is fine. Um all right, so oh, I know 
Germany was seeing play. But I also... I Right, so the one-of, I'm going to say, is going to be the Soviet Zero Four because it's fine, but it's not world-breaking. The... Oh, between the four and the two, though, this is really, really difficult. Um... Were people going to be playing enough orders to have... I mean, you guys were lunatic enough not to be playing <laughs> fortification. Um... No, I'm going to embrace the madness. So I'm going to say nine would have been signals, or would have been Nakshub, two would have been pioneers, one would have been whatever the Soviet one's called, engineer battalion, and zero is going to be Jasko. And I'm going to have gotten all five of them wrong. Um, so uh, I just send that. That is your guess, and you are in fact entirely wrong um <laughs> why wouldn't i be so going from the bottom up the card at zero was actually signal regiment japan was brought by one player and it was re big ben's japan france resistance that was the only japan main in this entire tournament nobody brought jagro okay i do not know why I literally cannot possibly explain why this existed. Jagro was incredibly popular on ladder, and we have gone over a number of really, really strong Japanese cards. <laughs> so why not just not play them? I think there was just a worry about the sec. Like, I, I mentioned the sort of rock, paper, scissors mentality that I had with Ramp. I think most people just saw that as rock and paper, as the best deck you can bring is either... The second best deck you can bring is either going to be Japan aggro or britain and britain beats okay. japan and japan beats decks i don't imagine they're going to be playing yeah, <laughs> i, I, I think mean, that I, was I, the I, thought I, process yeah, i still think it's <laughs> lunacy but fair um then the code at one is engineers the soviet zero four so this I got that, so i got that one right this was played in um oh sorry 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 Actually, that's that's incorrect. The card at one is Jasko. Uh, Blue ran it in the U.S. ramp deck that he played. Um, so he had the sig It's in the strategic planning list. And so you can make a zero yeah. eight um, Jasko to play around tactical strike. Uh <laughs> okay. no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, the card at two was engineers. Um, okay. And it was played in the two Soviet control lists. It did not see play in any of the Soviet tokens lists. I did... I'm kind of surprised by that. But I think the idea at the time was just like, this doesn't have token synergy. It's not aggressive. People were doing some wild stuff. Like some of the tokens lists were running the zero cost one one blitz guy. Um, They were running the one cost zero one smokescreen guy. We were doing some wild things and none of them involved playing engineers. Um... Now, who wants HQ defense? Anyway, carry on. Now that leaves us with Pioneer Company and Nakshu, the two credit cheating cards, um, to the surprise of uh, <laughs> not many. Um, now the card that saw four was Pioneer Company. This card was seen in um, the, there was some weird air decks, but some of them ran it, some did not seem to run it, uh, and then it was run in all of the Britain control lists just because you could get carpet bombing out on turn six. Um, yes. and then the card that had nine ver copies of it was, in fact, Nakshub. This was run in every single German deck. Every single player had a German deck, except for Blue Blast, who had two German decks, and his ramp. Um, and that was sort of, I think, his strategy with the ramp deck is he doesn't need to win on the ramp deck. He just plays Germany, and then the ramp deck, and then loses game two, and then brings Germany again and wins. <laughs> sure. I mean, when I see the, when I understand that prevalence of the Germany deck, I can totally get the Nakshub being straight nine of. Um, kind of missed that one in my thinking, mainly because I was being biased by the the insanity of it all. I I still think that the the, the Jagro not turning up still bakes my brain, but fine. Now, uh, now I will ask you, since I've sort of explained which of these I play, um, that that was in the process, but. Do you think any of these have been changed? Like... I know, well, obviously, I know Pioneers has now. 
Um, because it literally just has. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pion- Thank the Lord. The most um, recent change to Pioneer aside. <laughs> yeah. Um, was, is it possible? Lord, help me, I hope I'm wrong. Is it possible Nakshub was either different or just stronger back then? So I can't, I can't imagine Signal's seen a change, and I'm not even going to comment on Jasko and Engineers, because I really can't wrap my head around either of them properly. So you are absolutely correct. Signal, Jasko, and Engineers have all remained completely the same um, throughout the history of cards. I, they're kind of designed around each other. Jasko blocks Signal Regiment, um, Engineers tries to heal over Signal Regiment, and Signal Regiment just burns down the opponent. Now, this was the version of Nakshu we were playing with. You are, in fact, correct that Nakshub was different. What? So, uh, as you read that card and come to take in what that means for the game, um, feel free to explain the difference between that version and the newest version. Or the, the current version, I should say. Yeah, I, I, I mean, in the end, it's, you know, it's, it's on paper, it's doing the same thing. You, you, you destroy an enemy unit and gain two credits. The only difference is that you can do it infinitely. <laughs> so of course everyone brought it. Who didn't, didn't bring this card? That's ridiculous. I mean, I have issues with the current level of Nakshub. I genuinely do. I am on record as saying, honestly, I cannot believe Pioneers got nerfed and it didn't. That's just ridiculous. Ridiculous. So, there is one important caveat, which is this is only with units, whereas the current version is units or orders. Um, fair. That is fair. It is only when a friendly unit destroys it. But... Which is part of the reason why Tactical Strike also didn't see play, and there was very little sudden strikes, because why would you run removal when it doesn't give you free credits? credits you're going to run... Yeah. Units with blitz, and you're going to run units with deployment effects because deployment effects trigger. It doesn't have to be in combat. Um, so you know, cards like Flam Panzer, for example, uh, uh, <laughs> was trigger. Flam this. Panzer is free money to then get your <laughs> whatever infantry you want to put down. But the Flam Panzers paid the two credits you need to drop your 35T, which rolls forward, hits something in the face, getting you another two credits for another 35D. So, Nakshub existed in that version for an additional 15 months after this tournament. It was not changed until September 2021. I, I, I imagine that Germany remained relatively popular. So, for the first... I'm gonna say... I don't have the exact numbers, but I'm gonna say for like the first four or five months once the OCC started, and for the two to three months before the OCC started, again, you can see the most played nation from every single player. Every single player in top 10 for about a six to seven month period was playing Germany most played. And I remember there was one tournament, I think it was the first or second tournament they introduced the top 34, um, or top 36, or whatever it was back in the day. Uh, it was the first one where they included a big chunk of the ladder. Every single player who qualified for that tournament had Germany most played. Um, <laughs> Germany was just the deck you played on ladder. And this is why we brought so many wild things, because you had played exclusively Germany. Every single game on ladder for the last six months, and now they're telling you you have to bring two other decks that aren't Germany? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I fully understand. Like, to a degree, it's not so much what you were smoking as what you were living with. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, you just... The value, I'm still trying to wrap my head around... It's a card that's one cost, print infinite credits. I mean, it, not literally, because you've got to draw some cards eventually anyway, but... Now, it... Oh, I think... Uh, insane. I think a big reason why it stayed around so long um, is... They did get to the point where they kept nerfing everything that wasn't Nakshub, 
And it got to the point where they nerfed every single viable German strategy that was not slow discard control into the ground that you couldn't play it anymore. Like, you just didn't play Nakshu because you couldn't do anything that wasn't discard in Germany. Yeah. Germany, after like five or six months of like just dominating everything, there was about a one year period where nobody brought Germany to any tournament because it was just so bad. Germany was the only like un truly unplayable nation in the game, despite having this version of Nakshu, because they literally just nerfed everything oh. else. <laughs> Good job, Dev. Good job. Well yeah. On point. I mean, this happens. Like, no offense. Like, honestly, I love 1939's team to, to bits, and they know I do. But, I mean, oh my. Good job, guys. Yeah, no, wood for the trees, children. And, uh, we do actually have Pioneer Company um, went through some changes as well. Um, but I'm going to save what those changes were for another video because they were changed for a very specific reason. <laughs> and not the current change. It was changed once before the most recent change. Um, and that one, it, it's not, for, in general, for the most part, it is not super relevant. It's largely very similar to the previous version we had in terms of functionality for what we were doing with it at the time. But there's one yeah. very specific reason, but I'm going to hold on to that. But yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, the number one deck in the game, invented by none other than Ari Big Ben, the winner of this tournament, um, was German Japan Midrange. So essentially, what these decks looked like was you would play a turn one, 34th Infantry. And then you'd do a turn two, 35T. Or um, alternatively, you would play the Geburg's Jäger, um, which is the can't be targeted by orders, Alpine, um, which used to be a 3-3. Three, three. And you would just play that with no other Alpine units in your deck. Um, and then you would play Flampanzer. And like a good 70% of ladder games in this time period came down to you needed 34th on curve. And you needed Flampanzer on curve. Because your opponent was also going to be hard mulliganing for those two cards. So the games would come down to just, they have 34th, I have 34th, they have Flampanzer, I have Flampanzer. Uh, Flampanzer also used to be a 3-4 at this point in time. Um... <laughs> yeah. So I'm taking a moment to process that, but sure, why um, not? Also, Panzer H, the uh, choose one of three cards to draw, that used to be a 2-5. Um, yeah, Germany, Germany used to be doing some things. Um, that were not fair, or particularly fun, and then you would just curve into the mid game where you're just playing these decent chunky units like the 2-5 Panzer H, the Panther G, um, and then once you got later in the game, you'd run out of cards if your opponent wasn't just completely rolled over by your opening start. Um, at this point in the game, you transition into your late game where you have like some 4 drops and maybe Panther G on the 5 slot, and then you have nothing at 6. Maybe some players ran Comet, but Comet wasn't too popular. And then at 7, you would have Kriegsmarine and nothing else. At 8, you would have nothing. At 9, you would have nothing. And then at 10, you would have Leopold, Bismarck, and two copies of Empire of the Sun. So basically, uh -huh. you would just try to use your strong units and strong early game to make it to turn 10. And then on turn 10, you would just play one of the two most, like, swing cards in the game, Empire of the Sun or Leopold. And you would try to use the Empire of the Sun to draw you into a hand where you just often kill them from hand after playing an Empire of the Sun, because on the following turn you do Kriegsmarine for 5, Nakshub 35T, hit them for 2 on the 35T, and then double joint off them for an additional 6. Um, and... <laughs> yeah. Germany was brought by every single player, and they actually had just nerfed Germany-Japan. It was still the most popular deck in the tournament, despite being just hit by several pretty huge nerfs. Um, and the people who weren't bringing it were trying out Germany-Italy-Alpine, so we're doing Germany-US midrange. Um, the U.S. had some broken things going on at that time as well. And, yeah, that that was the meta. Um, in the end, to this tournament, there was nine Germany decks brought, five British decks, five Soviet decks, three U.S. decks, and one Japanese deck. And if you add all that together, it is 23 out of 24 decks, because there's just one deck, I have no idea what it was. They never said what it was on stream, he never got to play it on stream. Who knows, lost of time. It was probably a Soviet deck, um, but... You know, who knows? I'm going to believe it was the one sane human being that brought Jagro with Signal Regiment. No. Uh... <laughs> yeah, so uh, the in this event, in this event, because you could only, you had to switch main nations every game, Germany 
was brought by every player. Germany was played in game one of every single set in this entire tournament. Every single set started with a Germany mirror. And then it would go on to whatever other deck you had. And then it would go back to a Germany mirror for game three, typically. Unless you thought that you could, like, have some sort of counter. Like, there was, there was just no effective counter. Like, they could burn out any deck that wasn't Britain. And if you were playing Britain, you lost on board. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, as we talk about it more and more and look at the, the way that these, these pieces fit together, and it's beautifully engineered in the way that not only we've gone through the cards, but you, you've put some thought into the direction that you've taken this and the timing of it, but you assemble this and you are looking at something, and yeah, it's there is only one meta deck, and why would you really care? Like, honestly, from a tournament player's perspective, and I have been many, many times, if I've got the option to play that twice in best two of three, why would I care what my second deck is? Yeah. Because it's going to lose anyway, or it's just going to be a coin toss between whatever second deck I brought, what second deck... does make sense as to why no one brought Jagro, though, because one bad matchup and then you you get two owed and you're done but wow that, yeah. i would not have enjoyed that tournament and that was sort of the reason jagro was less popular is specifically jagro into germany was just you'd play a bunch of fast stuff and they'd play a slightly slower stuff and then maybe you get in like six eight damage in in the first three turns and then they play naxub and the game is over because every single yeah. they just play like 20 credits worth of cards on turn five um or they just don't even need that actually they can they just have larger stuff and then you eventually hit a point where you run out of cards they didn't have things like Kika or not Kika um they didn't have cards like Dragon Slayer or the yeah. E85 Japan just had flood the board and Germany had to flood the board but better <laughs> but yeah, you're credit I, cheating it, it, at the it, same time <laughs> Time. Yeah, I mean, it turns out if you give someone credit cheat they will do surprisingly well so uh yeah that brings us to the end of everything i have for you this was occ1 june 2020 um i came in this as a starry-eyed relatively new player um i played like really my second ever time grinding ladder to qualify for this brand new spanking tournament we had no idea we were talking to ollie in stream chats discussing format changes everything was the wild west it was a much very very different time very very fun time to play cards competitive and uh, at the time, I got third, um, did pretty well in the first round, uh, lost to a disconnect in round in the semifinals because this was before they had a reconnect feature. <laughs> um, oh, good. And then I, I, I ended up third place. I felt pretty good, you know, first time ever earning cool. money from playing video games. And I think most people probably just thought I was another person playing Germany and didn't think twice. Um, and it was not until uh, the next sort of era of cards OCC that um, I became one of the names of a group of top players and the meta changed and maybe that is a story for a different video in the future. We will see. But thank you very much for joining me, Bear. Um, where can people find you and your content? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a pleasure. Um, you can find me uh, basically all over the place at Bear underscore Gardener. So there's YouTube, Bear underscore Gardener, Twitch.tv slash Bear underscore Gardener. And you'll find links to all of my other stuff in there. Uh, I have a Discord. I'm active in the cards main Discord. I'm in J-King's Discord. Uh, <laughs> I'm not difficult to find. I'm in social media too. But my name doesn't change. It's Bear underscore Gardener everywhere. And uh, please, come, come say hi. Uh, my content's I think, on the whole. A lot of new player stuff, and then a few more niche game theory stuff for more advanced or moderate players, or people who just like listening to me ramble. Well, great. Thank you very much. All of that will be in the description of this video, and uh, as we went through recording this, I had an idea in my head um, that I, after this, I'm going to go through this tournament and sort of pick a handful, maybe a top three of my favorite games and just go over this games. And that will come out in a separate video uh, shortly after this. So look out for that. Um, so you can get to see what some of these game plays looked like. Um, this is how these decks played around. So expect that. Subscribe if you haven't already to catch those. And join my Discord, join Bear's Discord, follow him, subscribe to him if you haven't already. And I will catch all of y'all in the next one.
Thanks for watching. What a performance there by J King. J King, full plot armor. J King is pushing himself into the ranks of the legend. J King is our world champion. J King 7. What? The back to back cards world champion.